Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Anthony Russell. I'm from the University of Michigan, and he's been going to talk on creating data visualization tools with Plotly Dash. We're really looking forward to it. So thanks, Anthony. No problem. Thanks, 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 Dan and Evan for uh, for having me. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give a little bit of a talk on making some visualization tools with with Plotly Dash. It's going to be mostly focused on just kind of some basic examples rather than getting too much into the, the details, but I'll show some examples of some basic interaction and then show you where you can find a few more advanced examples that are hosted on the Dash site and show you something that uh, I was working on over the summer with one of our, our student interns. Uh, so yeah, I guess I'll just go over a little bit of the background on myself and who I am. Um, then I'll get into what exactly this Plotly Dash is. And I'll try to do a few live uh, demos, a few examples. And then I did want to include just a little section at the end. So Side is loose sharing. Okay. Uh, so if you're interested, I'll, I'll send these slides out and you can look, look at it a bit more. It's a, our, our primary mission is uh, mapping ocean wind speeds by checking how um, the direct signal from a GPS satellite to our satellite uh, changes when it scatters off of the earth. So uh, when water is more turbulent, it's uh, scattered signal more. So we can determine how strong a wind speed is by checking how, uh, how much scatter there is off the ocean surface. Uh, I'm primarily a C++ developer, but I have been doing more Python in the past uh, few years. So we've had more and more uses come up for it. And we've been trying to do a lot more like graphical uh, applications and Python's been really good at doing stuff like that, especially quickly. Uh, I'm not a web developer, so there, there will be a few web to, you know, dev kind of stuff where we're setting up servers. So if anyone is web developers in here, they might, I don't know, might shudder at some of the things that I'm doing. So <laughs> feel free to, to call me out. <laughs> uh, I am, uh, I'm also not affiliated with Plotly Dash. So if you have any, you know, I won't be offended if you have any issues with the library or anything. I'm just, it's just something I've been working on over the, the summer getting more into. So I just wanted to present it because I thought it has some cool uh, features that, you know, I think it, people might be able to find some applications for. Um, okay, so what is Plotly Dash? So it is an open source framework, so it's all, all free. You don't need to worry about, about paying for anything. And you can find it you know, in your standard Anaconda or PIP and just install it that way. Um, it seems like it's mostly bringing together a lot of different services that exist. Like Flask is what it's using underlying for making the, the web servers that is standing up. And a lot of the plots that it makes have matplotlib running underneath it, but it kind of puts it all together into one easy to use interface. It also really does help with, um, it can, you can write through basic HTML and CSS in it. And it's a little bit easier than having to write up a whole markup language. So it makes it quite a bit easier than actually doing like a full, you know, developing a website from the ground up. So it gives a lot of, um, you know, really helps you accelerate trying to stand something up quickly. Um, it does, there isn't just, for some reason, there's not just one uh, library you have to pull in. It, like you have to pull in like the Dash, the Dash bootstrap components, core components and Plotly all separately. Uh, and they don't align each other. So you do have to like kind of pip install or Anaconda, select them all. Um, not, not a huge deal, but just something that, you know, to keep in mind if you're working with it on your own as you're looking through the different uh, library features. Um, so now I'm going to try going through a few uh, examples. So the first one I wanted to walk through is just Plotly provides one example um, that I think is a really great way to start. And then I'll walk through a couple of examples that I put together that I think show off a few features that I, I found are interesting. So in Plotly's basic example, what they want to do is they have this CSV just, you know, I'm sure that's tiny for everyone, but it's a, 
it's a, it's a CSV of countries, their population, what continent they're on, the average life expectancy and the GDP per capita. So what this example will try to do is come up with an interface where you can look through this data in a much, much cleaner interface and trying to parse through a CSV. So let me drag this over to this side and get our basics going. So um, what we have here is just a uh, VS code is what I'm using to edit this code. So um, this is a, let's see, a 37 line example that they, they provided. And what it does is spits out this website. Um, so I'll walk through line by line on the code and kind of show you what everything is doing and how it's creating this app or this web application with just what's in here. So first basics is just, you know, the standard imports. Then it's reading the CSV that I showed you online here. Um, let's see if I can, just a long, long URL. Then uh, we initialize a dash application. So it's all, all fairly basic, but then we get this app, um, app variable out of that. Then the next thing that most dash applications will have is this layout. So if you're familiar with HTML, some of this might look uh, like something you've seen before. So it's establishing devs and creating items on the web page. So this first dev is just a header where it says, you know, my first dash app. So you can see that is what's showing up right at the top here. Then this HTML HR is a, I think it's like a header break. So there's this, this little line that's going across. Then after that, it gets into some of the dash specific uh, features that it's adding to the website. So the next thing it's adding is the radio items. So these are these three little circles that you can click on. So it defines them as first the options that it displays, uh, which are listed in the, in the options tag is a little array. Then the value it gives it is uh, whatever you want the default value to be. So it starts out as the life expectancy. And then it gives an ID. So uh, if you're familiar with this, this ID can be used for uh, stylings if you're using CSS. And it can also be used for callback functions. So you'll see later on, we're going to reference that ID value to uh, let us know when that value changes so we can adapt the rest of the web page. Um, the next item that this page shows is uh, what they call a, a data table. So it's another dash specific thing. It's all it is doing is taking a pandas data frame. Oh, so I should have mentioned it's reading the CSV into a pandas data frame. So I'm not sure if that's a common thing that most people are aware of, but uh, what a pandas data frame is, is it's a series of data with all the columns typically have a string as the header. So you know what all the different values in the, uh, what all the different values in the columns are. For this particular instance, you can see that the CSV includes uh, a little header uh, on top of each of the columns. So that's how we know what's inside of our data frame. And you can see that these little, um, the headers for life expectancy and GDP uh, match up with what are the options on si inside the radio items. So later on, you can see that they, you can directly reference the, the data frame based on those radio items. Um, so what it's doing in this, data table is it's just taking the data frame, uh, take, converting it to a dictionary. And then this is creates uh, a little thing you can page through to look through a CSV. It's just a little way to look at the raw data and a bit more of a clean interface than trying to parse through a big like wall of text. So I haven't found too much use for that, but it is a nice way to kind of organize if you want to be able to have the raw data available instead of just through plots. And then the final item on this HTML page is a graph. So these can be fairly dynamic uh, about whatever kind of graph you want to make, but a graph object will just tell the HTML page there's going to be a graph here. And then later on in the code, we'll define what that graph will actually look like. So um, down below here, we have a callback function, which is going to actually fill in the graph. So if you're not familiar with callback functions, and anyone who's a you know a more proper web developer can feel free to correct it into my terminology. But 
on, on this term, on the at callback is what's called a function decorator. And so uh, I believe anything with the at before on top of a function is a function decorator. But what it's saying here is we have an input field and an output field. For this, uh, for dash specifically, anytime the input field changes, it'll run the function, use the in whatever's in this input as the parameter to the function, and then we'll tag an output. And it'll be the, expecting you to return in the function whatever the output is, whatever you've specified in the function decorator as the output. So for this particular instance, um, our input is the component ID, the my final radio item example. So that was this, um, if you look up at this top where we established the radio items, that's the ID on this item. So this function knows anytime the user clicks inside of here, we want to run this callback function. And then same thing with the output. Our output is the uh, my final graph example which matches the ID to the graph. So this function knows that it should be kicking back the graph object, and we want to store that inside the graph on our HTML page. Um, this function will also run when the web page initializes. So if you don't have a default value for your radio items, you may want to make sure that you're handling what happens when there's nothing selected, like maybe either showing a blank graph or something. But in this particular instance, uh, if we refresh this page, you'll notice the default value is life expectancy and it plots it just when you lo lo load the web page without uh, needing to necessarily have the user hit the, uh, the radio item to populate it. So in the, in the actual function, the P PX is what they, uh, is one of the Plotly libraries. It's Plotly Express. It's just commonly called PX is how they have decided to uh, brand it. And then it's specifying that it wants a histogram. Um, and then it uses the data frame DF that we established earlier from the, uh, when we read in the CSV. And then along the X axis, we have the different continents. So it is parsing the data frame and sorting by continent. Um, or, you know, because it's uh, sorting each of the countries into continents. And then uh, we're specifying that we want to average. And then the Y is just um, whatever the chosen column was and then the average value they get out of it. So we could also do a max or a min, but right now this is just gonna take the average. So. When, right now, it's just showing the average life expectancy on each co continent by averaging together all the countries inside the data frame. So I can switch it to population, um, GDP, and it'll adapt to it. And every time it's running through that callback function saying, okay, my radio item has changed. Let me kick back this new graph. Um, and then the final item on here is just a, uh, a main. So if you're not familiar with this terminology, like the if name main, that makes sure that the, uh, the Python script is running, but if you were to import this file, it wouldn't actually run the app run. Uh, so what this does is this just runs it. I have it set to run um, in the debug mode, and then it's running on port 8001, which is an arbitrary port I chose because it's not a commonly used one. Um, Running in the debug mode, this is a little in the weeds, but I think it's still um, nice. It gives you this little button down at the bottom uh, right. And if you click it, you can see if there's any errors, if the server is still available. But one thing we found useful is this callbacks. You can figure out how long it took to actually run the callbacks. So if you're trying to debug like a website that's running really slow or some kind of plot, you can see which function is actually holding you up. And you don't need to worry about like running through you know, a debugger or anything. You can kind of just watch it flow through and see who's your, your holdup. Um, but so that's, that's what I kind of wanted to go through on the first example. Um, before I move on to the next example, does anyone have any questions on this? We've got one in the chat. Oh. Um, it was uh, for radio items. Can you dynamically retrieve them from the CSV header rather than manually type them in? Uh, I believe you can, yes. Um, you would just need to, 
because um, this is running uh, before the reading into the data frame is run before, you have access to everything in the data frame when you're running this app layout function. So I don't know the exact syntax, but there's got to be a way to grab just the headers off of the a pandas data frame. And you can even see here in the um, in the data table, it's referencing that data frame. So you have access to the data frame already. Um, the only thing to note is that um, I believe this code is only run once when the server is set up. So if you were to start the server, add a new column to the CSV that you're reading, and then go on the website, it wouldn't update because the server is already read in the data frame and you're just changing how the user accesses it. Um, I think, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. If not, uh, yeah, let me know. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Columns, okay, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you might need to do some filtering to if you only want certain, like if you want to not filter by country, but I don't know. Yeah, so definitely. One question. Sure. How did update graph? What is it that, that triggers that? I, mean, I don't see any reference to update graphs. So is that a reserved function name or something? Yeah, so um, so Dash is handling the calls to it. So how it runs is off of this function decorator, the at callback. So this tells the Dash application that um, to look for this component ID to change. And inside here, we establish what the component ID is. So we're saying if the component ID, uh, my final radio item example changes, then, um, then execute the function. So it's kind of hidden to us how it actually calls, but if you were to break in there and look through a stack trace, I think you'd see there's some kind of dash overhead going where it's parsing through the decorators to know when to call this. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know the full background of how it does it, but I think if you were to look through a stack trace, you could see it. But I think the biggest thing is, is that decorator specifying the input is how we tell dash, this is when you should call this function. Okay. Um, and you can also, you can specify multiple inputs and outputs too. So if you want this to change off of like a radio item and something, you can give it multiple parameters and it'll uh, run whenever either of them are, are sent. Uh, yeah, no problem. Okay. So any, any other questions? Okay. Uh, I'll move on to the next one. So um, this next one is going to show how to plot a GPX file. So uh, if you have familiar GPX files are, uh, they're essentially XML files that contain a bunch of location data, usually from GPS. Um, however, there are other GNS constellations that it can track. It's typically just a large XML file of positions. So um, in my work, we do a lot of uh, stuff with geospatial data. So having a system where we can dynamically plot, uh, you know, any kind of, all of this data was really beneficial to us. So for this example, um, I'm gonna start it first and I'll do a similar thing where you just kind of run through uh, all of the uh, lines and kind of show what they're doing. Um, okay, so let me swap over. Okay, so similar thing as last time, we're opening up uh, or doing our imports. However, this time, instead of opening up a CSV and reading it into a data frame, I'm just opening, I'm using a library called GPXPy. Uh, I'm not familiar with the ton of details with it, but it opens up a GPX file real smoothly and stores it into a, a class that you can access later on. Uh, then same thing as before, next we establish our, our layout. So this is a very, very similar layout to the, the other one uh, where you know I give it the website name. Oh, I can try to move this out. Uh, the website name, put a little break in between, and then I made a graph. So here's the first example of you can do inside of, right now I just had this embedded, but in the next example, I'll actually move it to an external CSS sheet. You can do your CSS stuff in here and give it a style. So I gave it a width, a height, 
added like a little bit of a shadow to the little box so it looks like it's you know stopping out but you can do if you're familiar with with web dev and wanting to make kind of custom views you can do a lot of uh you know you're not limited on what you can do with with uh, plotly it's just helps take some of that away from you if you don't want to do it i guess but same thing we have a a graph uh, and i gave it an id so this one i just have it running uh this input gpx graph id uh, this one I, I have just found is like kind of the standard for how you get it to run once when it starts up. So for this example, I don't have any kind of interactive um, buttons on it. It's just one time running through and just plotting it. So it's expecting the, the ID of the original graph. Um, and then it's I'm telling it in the function decorator that I want to output the figure, which will be the, um, the GPX graph figure. So we're going to output a graph. So the first thing I did was run through the uh, GPX track and just uh, grabbed out the first segment and just put all of the lats and lawns into a big dictionary and then made it a pandas data frame. Then next, I'm creating the, the figure that will actually be displayed here. So this one has a few more steps to it than just making a basic histogram. So first I tell it that we're gonna make a new figure and then it's gonna be a scatter map box plot, map, map, map box uh, plot. And so what that means, we're gonna have a map on the background and have some kind of scatter plot over top of it. Next, I specify what kind of background I want. So there's a few different ones built into it where you can have diff you can have satellite data in the background. You can have, uh, I think a few different ones with just so like the lakes and, and oceans. I chose open street map since this was done in a, a city. Uh, then on top of that, uh, oh, so this, this next part, we then tell it, so the map is gonna, you know, it, does, it needs to know where to look on the map. So I took all of the, uh, I found the mean latitude and mean longitude from the GPX file that I gave it and used that to center the graph. Then I gave it a little title and I zoomed it in so that uh, we're closer to the center point of the of the track. And then here is where I actually add the trace of all of the little points in the GPX file. Um, so I turned out the legend, but this is again, just using a pandas data frame where I give it the longitude for the longitude and latitude for latitude. And because I specified that it's a scatter map box plot, it knows that it's geospatial data. So it knows where to put it on top of the open street map. Uh, and then you can also specify um, if you want to have more advanced uh, information inside there, you can, I just gave it the little name GPX point, but you can put any kind of meta information in there. So if you want to store, uh, I don't know, like this was uh, from a, I think a run I did. So like, I don't know if you can like put like a speed, like current speed or something in there. If you have some kind of uh, Z value that you want to do. You can also dynamically change the color, which I guess I don't have an example of in here, but you can do things to modify the, um, the, the spatial data that you're plotting. Uh, and then again, we're just returning the plot that we generated. And it knows because we specified in the function decorator output the, uh, that we're going to be returning the figure for GPX graph, uh, that that's where that is going to go. And then again, same thing at the bottom, we have a main and then the debug mode. And then I specify port uh, 8002, just in case I wanted to run multiple examples at the same time, they won't conflict. Um, I think I saw, oh, now I did it. Uh, I think I saw there's a question in chat. Uh, was that true? Um, someone wants to know if the scripts will be available. I already shared a link for that. And someone gave you kudos for your use of uh, this month average. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I have these all up on, on a GitHub in the slides, but I can I can send that link around um, after, or if you already sent it. Yeah. Okay, nice, perfect. I'll have the notification. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can also send the, the slides to you. Um, yeah, any any other questions on, on what's going on there? Um, yeah, what's up? Is there any uh, specific reason for the decorator that output is first and then input? I actually don't think you need to do it in that order. Um, you can, I think you can do it in any, any order. I did it in this one because this was the one that I pulled from the plotly dash 
example. So I was figuring if that's the order they're going in, that's what I'm doing. But you can also do, um, if you ever need it, I think you can also, if, yes, another see. definition is called state. So coding you, if you don't want to have your function trigger on something, but you that. still want to use it as input, you can use what's called state and give it the ID. And you can take it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. I'm just like, uh, like, let's say I have two yeah. radio buttons um, and I want to know, and when like radio button option A changes, I want to know what radio B is, but I don't necessarily want to run it every time radio B changes. You can just take in the state of that too. Um, but I don't think that that needs to be in a specific order. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. If anyone else is familiar with, with Plotly Dash and knows different, feel free to correct me. Uh, any other questions? Client is interacting with the server. Oh, um, I guess I can try it. So, right now I just have it running off of a local host. Um, so I'm just loop back like this the same system going between the client and the server. You can in this app run, you can specify a host that you want it to be running at if you have like a proper web server installation. But at the end, I will show a brief example on how to use something called Green Unicorn to do a proper deployment. And that'll be a bit more of a production level environment type of thing for how you'd want to actually deploy it to have a more uh, you know, robust client server architecture. Um, so yeah, we'll get, get to that in a, in a sec. Um, okay, uh, we'll move on, on to the next one. Okay, so... Let me get this last one started up. Okay. So, uh, well, this one could get uh, could potentially mess up the Zoom, but we'll we'll see. Uh, so this is a um, something I the reason I started getting into Dash a bit more on my own was to to make this, which was I'm learning a new instrument and I wanted to have some kind of feedback about making sure that I was playing at a consistent volume level. So what this application does is it just listens to the microphone, pulls out the volume level and kind of makes a live graph of the volume level that you're going. And then you can download it as a CSV. So I can like, you know, first make sure visually that like, you know, for 30 seconds, I'm not kind of getting tired and, and falling apart. And also I can compare if I'm more consistent now than I was two weeks ago. So that was kind of my um, idea for, for getting into this. Uh, so a little, little bit of a, of a hacky program, but I think it's kind of kind of interesting. Um, so here, this is an example of loading in. I'm going to make the, uh, let's see this thing a little bit bigger. So here we're loading in uh, style sheets. So first I wanted to load in, um, DBC is what they abbreviate the dash bootstrap components. So I wanted a, a theme just to make the styling a bit easier. So I'm using their bootstrap theme, uh, or maybe it's just, I think bootstrap might be a general web dev thing. I think it might just be their flavor of it. Uh, and then I also made my own CSS. So if you're familiar with CSS, it looks something like this. And all I'm doing is just telling it how I want to style different buttons or containers and making stuff. And what it that gives you is that you don't need to have um, something that looks like this nested inside your layout. You can kind of abstract that out to another thing to make your, your code a little bit cleaner. So when I establish my Dash application this time, I give it the style sheet that I uh, wanted to use. So I can give it a I'm giving it a, uh, a list of sheets as a parameter so it knows to reference those. And then uh, same, you know, general HTML layout. I have my header, uh, a graph. I'll get back to the interval. And then I have a little div that has the button, uh, the two buttons and the uh, download. And I just, this is a download item. Uh, this, it's a tool that um, Dash gives you that helps you create a way for users to download a file from your server. Um, this interval is running, uh, I'm establishing it through the application so that when the user loads it, it'll start ticking. All right now I have it set to every uh, 1,000 milliseconds, every one second, it'll attempt to update. Uh, 
And this would be important when it's trying to uh, actually listen. Um, and then I just put these three in a div to, uh, to be able to put them on the same line essentially. And then I gave the div uh, a class name along with the buttons. So you can see there's the button container. Um, I just called it like button and blue button. But you can see these class names match up to what's in the CSS. So if you're, if you're not familiar with CSS, this is how I'm telling which HTML item I want the CSS to modify. So here I'm just setting the color uh, and giving each one some padding. And then this is how I got them to the buttons to center uh, relative to the, the page. Um, so then here is a line that we'll get back to when we're looking at green unicorn, but you, uh, I'm storing off the server object and that will be important as a reference that we need later on when we go to deploy it because green unicorn will need to know where the server object is. Um, and then here, I'm using global variables for this just to make the example a little bit easier. You can. This will store it on the server. And if multiple people are using it at the same time, it will overwrite each other. So you want to use something called the DCC. make this a bit easier to understand, but I just wanted to make that that clear. Uh, okay, is it still, I don't know, is there anyone listening? Okay, still going through, okay. So um, this function, I don't wanna to spend too much time on, because we're already at 742, but this is, uh, I'm using something called Pi Audio, which I am absolutely not an expert on, but I followed through an example just showing how to read in some basic audio uh, information from the, the channel. And what it's doing is if it's, uh, if the recording has started, it will grab uh, 16 bits out of the, uh, the buffer and find the volume data by doing this, this, uh, what is that? Some kind of linear algebra fun they're getting the normal uh, value from it and then appending it. So I don't fully understand how that's working, but um, if anyone is an audio, uh, expert, I think a Pi Audio could be a real good, uh, I don't know, an interesting talk for the future. But I felt this was just a, an example I pulled from the their user documentation about how to capture a volume level. So I would definitely is something I would love to spend more time looking at. But for now, I guess just assume that this is how we're grabbing volume. And then what I'm doing is I'm keeping a running list of the most recent 30 samples. So if the volumes ever, the my volume data is ever greater than 30, I pop off the end and add on to the end. And then I sleep for a second and go back. Uh, and then if the recording ever stops, I'm just terminating all of the streams. So that brings us to, now we have two functions with callbacks. Uh, this is my, my crude way of coming up with a start and stop button. So I'm taking in as the input, this, uh, the start button number of clicks. So anytime it runs, it gives me a parameter for a number of clicks. And then I take the number of clicks and do modulus division by two, and just to see if, uh, if we're at a point where we should be starting or stopping. Um, and if, it's, if we're starting, then I open up a new thread to run this function above so that recording can kind of run in the background and isn't limited by uh, the one that's displaying the graphics. Um, then this is, handling the download button. So uh, if the if it's this function will, anytime you give something a uh, an input of number of clicks, it'll run once when the number of clicks is zero when the application starts up. So this right here is just saying, okay, make sure the value is not zero. Then if it is, we open up, uh, I'm just making and naming a CSV with a random string and then writing to it and then writing out a CSV. And then I use the, a, value from dash called dcc send file, which is just the easiest way I could find to just send a file from the server. And then it pops it up like in a way you've seen before where, you know, it prompts you to download the file to your downloads directory. Um, then I believe this is the final callback function here. So if you remember at the top, we gave this n interval, uh, we established that 
on this graph update. So this is saying every one second, we're gonna trigger this and we're gonna call the callback function. So instead of having the user click something, we're saying run this every second. So every second, we're gonna grab whatever's in our volume data in that global variable. And then we're going to put it onto a scatter plot and we're gonna use the lines and markers. Um, and then we're just establishing the, the layout of it. Um, so I'll get this running in a second and hopefully it'll go with the zoom mic uh, also capturing. But one thing I wanted to point out was this graph is, uh, has this animate to true. So you can see what that looks like. Um, whenever it gets a new point, it makes a little animation didn't like that, but it makes a little animation between where it was and where it is. So if you're capturing live data, it, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting way to, to be able to actually like visualize stuff moving around. There is like a three second latency I've noticed, uh, but it's it's far from far from a perfect audio interface, but it's kind of a cool way to present uh, live data. It's having this uh, all built in to animate itself every time the scatter plot changes. Uh, and then we can stop it download the CSV and it'll pop over into our, uh, I guess it's just a one, no commas, but just a big you know, table of data. So yeah, I think, I know I kind of rushed through that, but I know we're coming up on, on time. Does anyone have any, any questions on this example before I move to the green unicorn? Okay. Let me get back into, okay. So uh, let me just run this real fast. So we've been running with this debug set to true. However, if I set it to false, it'll give us a nice warning that says, warning, this is a development server. Do not use it in a production deployment. Use a production WSGI server instead. So, what we're going to do is go through what that means and how we uh, and how we address it. So, uh, Green Unicorn is a web server gateway interface, and what this will do is this will sit in between your application running and um, and, and the calls to it from the clients, right? So the big thing that it gives you is. Um, when you run your, your green unicorn, you give it a number of threads. You can modify this to however much your systems. You can have multiple people calling into your application without them needing to wait on someone else's callback to run. You can have it handling multiple environments. So that's what the, the warning is trying to get you to look at is it doesn't want, it's not gonna be ready for production because you're got, everyone's gonna be stuck behind each other. Uh, the tip, I think it defaults to four threads, but if you're working on a strong server, you can uh, beef that up quite a bit. And you can also specify um, with this dash B option, what your host name is and the port you want it to run on. So if you have um, like, you know, if you can use an 8,000 port or if you're running on like an HTTPS server and you have your, your certificates and stuff, you can run it on port 443. You can give it a proper server name. I know a lot of people will still um, run it on like a port like 8000 and then serve it through like a reverse proxy on an Nginx server, since those are a little bit um, like a better way to, I think, serve the certificates and stuff. I don't know, Evan's not I think you might know more better than that. <laughs> but the, the last part of this uh, invocation is this is the name of our Python file. Um, so for, he, for this example, I gave it volume level dash which is uh, just the name of this .py file. And then the, this app.server, we pulled off this server variable and that is what this green unicorn is looking for, is whatever that variable is. So if you have multiple servers you're storing and want, you know, but they're in the same Python file, you need to specify what that is. And that will provide an interface where you can have multiple systems calling into it. Um, so that's the, the basic for if you want to set it up on a, a production environment. Um, so uh, I have, I think, a couple more slides. Is that, is that all right? Or do you want me to try to? Okay. 
Uh, so if you go, I think I'll, I'll get the slides sent out, but Plotly has this great website of all these examples that you can parse through and try to get inspired for ideas for your own work. A couple that I thought were um, pretty cool was this satellite dashboard that someone made. And it has a really clean look and you can look at, uh, I think they have two different satellites on here and you can see its current position, its path. Uh, you know, this has got this like latitude and speed that are updating live along with its fuel and battery levels. Um, someone also put together a medical provider charges dashboard, which has a, a lot of information on it, but I thought it had some really um, neat stuff where you can see this uh, using the scatter map box. So right now they just have, I think it's, if you, instead of using OpenStreetMap, if you just use something called dark, it'll look something like this, but you can see this, that they're controlling the color and the size of these objects. Uh, if you go to Michigan, it'll tell you the average cost uh, of different hospitals and what they charge for different procedures. I found that, um, oh yeah, also big, all these um, plots are interactive so you can zoom in and zoom out on stuff. Um, University of Michigan healthcare system is apparently by far the most expensive in the state. <laughs> um, but you know, those are, I think uh, looking through this, you know, the, the, their website has a ton of really cool examples. This IMDB one is really cool too. Apparently IMDB is a good API. So someone made a really cool way to like look at uh, different movies and languages and stuff that, that movies are in. Um, but yeah, over the, over the summer, so we had, I worked for the University of Michigan. We had a student who's uh, going into her junior year and she put together this website for us to visualize a lot of our, our hurricane data. So um, you can select out different, uh, whatever hurricane you wanna look at and then it'll display it. We got it running on a slow web server that we're hoping to beef up, but um, yeah. Eventually it'll load some of uh, our, our Cygnus hurricane tracks. Um, yeah, it's just a bit of an easier way to show off what we're, um, you know, the data we're capturing to people who might not want to download files and actually have to parse through everything. So um, these tools have become really helpful to us working in kind of a science setting because we can, uh, I guess it's typically common where you'll make slides of different plot, you know, plots of all different kinds of data. Uh, and then you'll get like feedback, like, oh, can you zoom in more on this or zoom in? But like, if you just, we've saved so much time by just like making these like websites and then it's like people can pick whatever thing they want to look at and then zoom in, zoom out, do whatever they want or toggle which things they want to see. It saved us a ton of time when we were just making these kind of internal data servers that our team can look at to, uh, you know, just to, to I don't know, check out what the latest versions look like, compare previous versions. Um, so yeah, all credit on this uh, goes to the student, Elizabeth Phillips. Um, yeah, she was just a, a freshman when she made this. So pretty, I think a pretty cool student project. Um, I know we were very grateful to have her working with us, but yeah, I think that was all I had. Um, I don't know, does anyone have any, any questions uh, at the end for, for anything that I, I talked about here? Did any? Well, hopefully, I answered that. Uh, any question. questions online? Anyone? What did you use to track your geospatial data when you were running? Uh, I used a Coros watch, okay. uh, just like a I don't know, like a little smartwatch thing. That's pretty easy to download from. Yeah, it has like a an app that it. Yeah, uh, goes. You know, it transfers all the phones, you know, all the data to you on your phone, and then you can download CS or GPX files. You can you can download all the standards like KML and all that, and then I just uploaded it to uh, to the site, and then yeah, yeah. Any? The Pi Audio stuff was really cool. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely love to learn more about how to, because there was whole things we can set up, like how wide do you want to search and you can like try to, like if you know what kind of sounds you're looking for, you can narrow in the audio channel to try to like isolate certain sounds. But yeah, I think when I was trying to put together these slides, I was like, oh, something's going to have to not spend too much time. <laughs> We're just taking the, the, the basic tutorial. <laughs> but yeah.
that could be a future talk for you if you are interested. Um, yeah, any any other questions? I saw there was someone, I don't know, Dan, did you address this person with the asking about Flask? Oh, okay, they're okay. asking about. Uh, I'm yeah, not sure if I actually addressed it or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I am, I'm using uh, Anaconda to do. Um, actually pull in all of the Python environments. Uh, I don't know, that's the easiest way I found to do it on, on Windows. Um, I think it, it takes a second to load, so I'm not sure if that's even gonna come up anytime soon, but. Did you respond to the question about the like plotting a route? I don't know exactly what they did, but. Can I use this as the basis for dynamically plotting a route? Ooh. Um, I'm, Bet you can. Um, you can. Ooh, you would need to set up some kind of like on callback listener for the graph object, and I believe that's possible. So I think Elizabeth did something like that, where you know, like if you click on, I guess we're clicking on still points, but if you click on different points in the storm, it'll jump the storm around. Um, but maybe there's some kind of on-click listener you can set up for the street map to put in the points and then draw a route between it. And then you could probably do some kind of calculations on the points you have. The um, question actually referred to uh, when you had but your bicycle route. Probably some way to do it. I don't know. That'd be an interesting, uh, interesting thing. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I, I don't have a, a, a clear answer on, on that one. All right. So not that I've tried, but I think there's a way. I guess would be the short answer. Thanks. Um, yeah. Any other any, any other questions? Oh. <laughs> if anyone has a question online, can you raise your hand so I have time to turn on the speaker? I think I should jump in. See anything? Okay. Yes, with, with that. I don't know if there's any, is there any kind of closing remarks that either Dan or, or Evan? Thank, yeah, thank you so much, Anthony, for coming and giving a talk about Plotly. Uh, hopefully it inspired everyone to go build some cool plots of data. Um, I also really like the volume example as well, because it was like, scratching your own itch when those are the, those are the fun projects of like oh yeah that's pretty cool yeah so yeah thank you so much anthony um yeah, no problem. Oh, thanks. thanks everyone for joining i really appreciate it um please join us next month uh first thursday of october or yeah brandon's giving the talk on uh ebay apis so that should be really fun um, and feel free to stick around and chat if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out and has a, yeah, wants to get involved in some way, feel free to st stick around and chat and stuff. And yeah, thanks again, Anthony. Yeah, no problem.